Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for, uh, thank you for collecting, collecting here uh, over lunch. Um, I'm very pleased to have uh, uh, a colleague and friend, Omar Ishraq, who is the uh, chairman and CEO of Medtronic, which is the leading medical device maker in the world now. Um, and also my colleague, uh, Connor Walsh, from the uh, Wies Institute, who will be commenting uh, on what Omar has to say. Um, so I uh, first met Omar about 10 years ago telephonically, but never actually saw him <laughs> face to face. had no idea uh, who or what he looked like. And I'm sure oh, the, uh, that was reciprocal. <laughs> but we met face to face a couple of years ago when uh, this outfit in Bangalore at Narayan Hospital was opening uh, a facility in the Cayman Islands. Um, so we had 24 hours together in the Cayman Islands, and I invited him to come to, come to Harvard. And it's taken a couple of years to orchestrate that. So we're very pleased that he's able to find time to come. Omar has been leading Medtronic for four years, and prior to that was at the General Electric Company for 15, 16 years, something like that. Um, so uh, he's of Bangladeshi origin, so he's got that strange <laughs> connect to, uh, to South Asia in some ways. Uh, but uh, you know, perhaps more interesting to us is really the uh, fabulous work that the company and his colleagues have been doing in uh, Thinking about medical devices for uh, um, you know resource poor resource poor country and settings, and thinking about the systemic changes that are need, needed to improve healthcare and diagnosis and so on and so forth. So, without further ado, what we thought we'd do is Omar will speak 15, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, something like that, um, and we want to move quickly to a conversation of some sort. And uh, Connor will also comment and share some some of his slides and innovation on uh, uh, device device innovation at the Wies Lab. So, Omar, all yours. Good, thank you. Thank you, Jeroen. So, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, thank you all for spending your lunch here. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll essentially talk about three topics. Uh, first, give you a perspective of overall healthcare in the world and what some of the common needs are, uh, no matter who you are and uh, which country you're in. Uh, followed by a little more of an analysis around India, specifically uh, around some of the issues uh, of healthcare within India followed by a, um, a, a little more granular look at uh, how we address uh, you know, what we call um, you know, the, lower, the bottom of the pyramid um, in terms of healthcare for India, uh, recognizing that that's only a, a subset of the entire uh, healthcare issue in India. So if I get started, uh, first of all, um, you know, if you're a stakeholder in healthcare, these three needs that I've outlined over there are pretty universal. Uh, they're common, no matter whether you're a government a manufacturer such as us, an insurance company, or a hospital provider, a physician, uh, whether in, in China or India or some small country somewhere or in the United States. Um, these needs encompass uh, all, all of those different areas. The priority may be different, but in the end, these are universal healthcare needs which we think are so longstanding. And I'll tell you why. Um, improving clinical outcomes in healthcare is a, is a quest that will never end. Uh, and I think you'll agree that uh, the desire for people to have better health is not going to suddenly disappear. Uh, lifespans have been improving over the last centuries, decades, years. Um, there's nothing magic about 2015 that says that lifespan will stop increasing. In fact, if you look at it over a long period of time, there's actually been an acceleration of, uh, of the increase in lifespan. Uh, and uh, we expect that that will continue because that's driven by our increasing no usage of technology and our increasing knowledge of clinical medicine. Uh, we've still got a lot to learn and, 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 and a lot of things we invent. And that drives increased life and we're, we're of the belief that this has uh, got unlimited growth. At the same time, there's a huge inequality of care. Um, things that are standards of care in, in developed markets, in developed countries for, for decades are not available even amongst people who can afford them in emerging markets. Um, and this inequality in care is something that has to be addressed and is a problem. And what's interesting is that it's not only a problem between developed markets and emerging markets, it's a, it's a problem within developed markets, within cities. Within a city you'll have a population who can afford the care because the government essentially covers it, but they don't get access to it for, for, for a variety of reasons. So driving equality in healthcare uh, and, and providing that access is, is very important. And thirdly, there is this uh, whole notion that healthcare is a cost burden. And in fact, uh, if you improve outcomes and improve people's quality of life and extend their life, it should be an economic driver. 
Uh, that seems theoretical, but we can break it down and demonstrate that there is a lot of cost that's trapped because of inefficiency in the delivery of healthcare. And as, as a result, the cost goes up. And because the cost is prohibitive, you can't really attack the other two, which is the continuous quest for improving outcomes, or at least it compromises your ability to, to, to attack the other two. So these needs, I hope I've shared with you, uh, and, and, and sort of um, you understand why we think of them as universal. These aren't going to stop one fine day. And, and it's true for everybody. And to a large extent, um, only the priority may be different. Uh, based on that, um, you know, I wanted to focus today on, on, on expanding access because uh, uh, the problem in India is really around this. And um, what we found, and which I'll talk to in a minute, is that all of these uh, factors that are put in there are, are the essentials of, of addressing this access problem. Uh, there's a lack of awareness, there's a lack of uh, infrastructure, physician training, um, and, and, and to address this it requires an ecosystem approach and new business models and new ways of thinking. So if I then look into India, um, you know, it's a, real, it's, it, it, it's a real conundrum and a paradox. In, in principle, India could be one of the world's largest healthcare markets and opportunities. It's got a population the same size of China, and yet the healthcare market in China is five times bigger than India. It's the same population. At the same time, uh, India has got better trained doctors of the highest quality, some outstanding providers, and yet the market is uh, market meaning access, in other words, because the market is a, is a measure of access, is 20% uh, is of that of China. Um, in addition, uh, you know, the diseases keep growing. The chronic diseases keep growing, and so the need is tremendous, and yet the, our ability to meet that demand just doesn't seem to be there. The immediate answer that most people have when faced with this, this one page, they say, well, it's because things are too expensive. Well, let me tell you something. When you look at it from our perspective, India is one of the most difficult places to do business in. We have the lowest prices in India than anywhere in the world. And our volumes are also the lowest, given that population. So you have low prices and low volume, which goes against every economic theory that we, could, we can think of, okay? And it goes without saying that you get poor margins and low return on investment if you get low prices and low volume. And you know, there are many companies who would say, hey, let's not go there. For us, it's different because our mission is outcomes focused because we want to address this access problem we've got to find a solution but but again let me give you some more facts around this our device prices in india are, are the lowest in the world like i said and it's significantly lower than china at the same time the patients are paying almost as much as in china so the patients are paying almost as much in china we're getting you know like 50 percent of what we get in china and so and the volumes aren't there. So this is a problem that needs to be resolved, which is a systemic problem. And we need to kind of address this. But, but you can understand the, that the paradox that India is, that uh, if you were short-term thinkers, we'd say, let someone else solve this problem, we'll come back. But we're not, and we shouldn't be, because the, the opportunity is huge. We've got assets to go address that, and it's one that we've got to go tackle. So uh, you know, some of the things that we, we've thought about to go address this. First, Increase public awareness uh, and develop a referral chain. There is no referral system in India. There is no methodology through which a person who gets ill goes to a place. That person is trained to refer someone to a certain place. That person then provides the right treatment under some kind of regulated guidelines. Instead, it's almost like a free-for-all. You go to who you know or you think who can do something. That person refers you to somebody who they think can do something, and, and through this this imperfect process, you get huge amounts of not only inefficiency in care, you get money being doled out along the way. And so that's where the gap is, in the sense that we don't make much money, the patient pays too much, so you got too many hands along the way collecting something for some reason. And most of it is inefficiently utilized. So building a systemic system of referral is critical in India, is critical. Uh, second, uh, You've got, to, you've got to do that first, because without that, it's pointless building a delivery system. 
So you've got to then build a delivery system. You've got to train your physicians. And then finally, to accomplish all of this, we need transparency. We need, we need intelligent but comprehensive regulatory reform. Uh, and we need to come up with new business models and partnerships. So, so that's the way in which we're kind of thinking about this. It's still too generic, what I've talked about, and I'll come into some examples of areas that we're, we're kind of touching on. Um, the one uh, conclusion that we've reached, and, um, and we're, we're reaching this conclusion not only in India, but across the board in healthcare, that you know, disease-focused uh, uh, efforts will yield the most impact. You know, why, does, why do any of you care about healthcare as, as, a, as an individual? You care about healthcare because healthcare offers you a treatment. If healthcare did not offer you a treatment or a way in which you can fix your problem, it wouldn't matter. It's pr it, there's no point in doing diagnostics if you don't know what to do when you get a positive result. Okay, so the whole point of healthcare is treatment. That's why one pays for healthcare. Treatments happen on a disease basis. And therefore, the highest value in healthcare, the way in which you can make the biggest difference is by focusing on a disease and moving the needle in that disease and figuring out what are all the factors that drive that change in disease. Building infrastructure on its own, like people often think building a whole bunch of primary care clinics will fix the problem because then people can, will not get ill. Well, the problem is in any given population, people are already ill. They've already got the chronic disease. And you want to prevent that from being escalated. And then you need delivery centers to go treat these people. So, and if you want to do that holistically for everything, everywhere, it's just too much. So you've got to focus on a disease. If you focus on a disease, then we want everybody from, from innovators to providers to new technologists to business model creators to governments to zero in on particular diseases and, and contribute along those lines and try to move the needle. So everything you hear me speak about now is a disease-focused uh, effort. And, and our view is that excel in a disease, move the outcome, scale that. Move to another disease, uh, do what you need to do, scale that, rather than scale infrastructure. Okay. Um, in India, we look at, uh, you know, and, and the issue is that you look at these different levels of the economic pyramid differently. You've got a premium end where the problem is not of money. People can afford the care. And believe it or not, there's a population the same size as the United States in emerging, bigger, in emerging markets that uh, can afford care and doesn't get it. If you then took uh, simply the adoption levels in the United States of just our therapies alone, and applied it to those people who can afford the care, that's, that's a huge number and a huge market for us. Um, and that's highly underpenetrated. So that's got its own issues where you can per perhaps start by building awareness amongst that population, by training, by creating delivery infrastructure, and essentially using th that source, which is a shift in funding from an individual who's ill, who's spending money in a car or something like that, but instead go spend money on fixing their own illness. Shift in funding to create an infrastructure of delivery and a referral system that can then be translated down towards what we call the value segment where, where products will be cheaper, the cost of care will be a little cheaper, more people can afford it. And then you've got the bottom of the pyramid, which, you know, through that flow down approach, it'll just simply take too long. There's just too many people in that, in that bucket. And to address that, you need the same thinking around diseases, but a different approach. And that's what I'll talk to in a minute. Um, so again, going back to the, to, the, to the way in which we talked about it, let me walk you through one specific example, and then we'll, we'll open this up for questions. First, um, again, our approach is, like I said earlier, selected disease. Selected disease, define the care continuum. What, you know, define the, you know, how does one get taken care of in the disease in a very specific level. Third is, how are people going to pay for this without depending on the government paying for it? Is there an ecosystem that pays for it by itself in that very narrow area? Is there enough uh, you know, economic stimulus uh, created by creating jobs to people who go do the diagnostics at a very low level? Uh, can you find a way of funding this thing in a self-contained fashion? And then finally, based on those, what's you know, our business case? That, that's the way we look at this knowing that if you can do all of these, you create value, and if you create value, we can make a business out of it. So those are the steps that we go through. And the one example that, that I'm gonna walk you through is, uh, is for chronic uh, ear infections, which 
I think I can see here many of you are from South Asia and, and, and you know, you've probably traveled in that part of the world and, and, and even here, you'll relate to the fact that ear infections uh, can be a problem. Many of you have children, you know, ear infections is, a, is, a, is, a, is an issue. In, in the developed world, those are easy fixes. You know, you get regular primary, there's a system. You go to regular primary care visits, they look at it, they, they treat it early, they, they give you antibiotics. Or if not, it, it goes all the way up to some kind of surgical procedure. It can be taken care of, completely cured. There is no issue at all. Yet, in, um, in the world, you've got 330 million people worldwide who have this disease, and 90% of the disease burden is in Southeast Asia and in, in, in those areas. And in 75% of the patients, it leads to hearing impairment, something that's completely unheard of in the developed world, and where the cost of treatment is extremely cheap, and, and the condition is easily diagnosable. So this is a case where you can, you know, you don't have too many variables. You know, you know the condition, you know the fix, you know it's a big problem, what do you need to do to go fix it, okay? Um, so um, <clears throat> that, that's what the second kind of column says. And what we then did is we lined up with a provider, uh, a clini clinician together with us who could help us kind of do this thing, zeroing it around an ENT center. We found that um, creating centers of excellence where treatment, where, where high level treatment is provided and then building around it is the most efficient way to do this because uh, you build a catchment around the most expensive point of care. And so you pull people in to that, change the outcomes there, that creates efficient source of funds and value that can fund f more um, you know, lower levels of care. So th that's the approach that we've taken, that select a certain center and work the catchment around, work the ecosystem of the catchment around it, as opposed to trying to address the ecosystem of the whole country, which, which is just too big. So a partner is very important. Um, how do we do this? We have community screening camps. We've developed uh, diagnostic tools and we've got quick referral and treatment. That, that, that's, it's, it's pretty straightforward. You train a bunch of community workers, they're, they're armed with an iPhone with a little otoscope, you know, the thing that they put in the ear. The community workers charge a minuscule amount of money, like a couple of dollars or something, it's, it's really cheap, and which the local people can afford. And we've tried this in a, in a slum in Delhi, where, where we go around, uh, the community workers go do this test. Um, the slum in Delhi, because that's proximal to this partner that we have where they can do the treatment. Uh, they take a picture of the ear, they send it on to the uh, diagnostic center who then uh, uh, does further referrals. In some cases, the community workers were, were working towards the point where they'll be armed with simple treatment like wax removal or simple advice. And, uh, and then eventually they get sent to the ENT center if the, if the, if the disease is advanced enough that it actually requires surgery. So, so that's, that's the journey we've been on in a very specific uh, kind of condition. We launched this in July 2013. We've looked at 70,000 patients screened by 20 community workers. So you know you can get quite a lot of volume. 30% um, of those 70,000 patients required follow-up. Uh, 2,200 of these patients were actually treated. And 300 of them actually had surgeries. Medtronic's traditional product basket only includes that 300. And yet for us, the entire ecosystem and developing that ecosystem to find those 300 patients efficiently pays for the whole thing from, from our perspective. And then we also, in that same vein, create jobs and training for these community health workers. So you build an ecosystem that's then self-contained, both for us and for that community. Um, and now we're scaling this uh, further with this one center and we're developing other centers. We've got three other partners in India and we're, we're scaling this thing up. Um, we're looking at the revenue streams and, uh, and by uh, what FI16 means by, you know, middle of next year. Middle of next year, we expect to have um, something like 300 uh, community workers screened and a million patients screened. So, so that's the kind of a journey we're on. Um, you know, our goal is over the next, uh, you know, seven to ten years to screen uh, over 200 million patients. Um, or twenty five percent of this target population know that this is still underpenetrated, but if you get twenty five percent penetration in in healthcare terms that's a that's a decent amount. You could do better, but that's a decent amount um, and you know the business isn't big but it's but but this is the case where a bottom of the pyramid kind of uh, work through volume you can start to scale up. We're looking at you know potentially two hundred and fifty million or so of revenue out of out of India alone out of this one thing. 
Uh, and it's just the learning that we have as an organization as well. You know, there's no reason why this should take too long. I mean, just think about it. Here's a condition that's well understood. Here's a condition whose diagnostics is clear. Here's a condition whose treatment is clear. Here's a condition whose treatment is inexpensive. And yet it takes like seven years to reach scale. And a condition whose treatment has been understood in the developed world for 50 years. And yet it takes seven years to get this to scale. And th that, I think, is a challenge for us. We need to figure out how to do these things much more quickly. I mean, it is just crazy. I mean, I tell my own team that, you know, how can this take so long? It just does. Because you're going to carry so many people with you. And you're going to put these things together. You're going to, you know, it just, it just takes the time, which to me uh, sometimes is frustrating. And I'd love your input as to how, how we make these things uh, move much more quickly. You know, we're trying this in other areas. We've got each of our business units have got a program like this. You know, our business units are focused on different disease conditions. So they've got other programs that they're driving to try to kind of uh, to do this in different countries around the world. And uh, there are two right now that we're studying in India. But you know, any one of these can be translated into India. It's where, where someone has a, uh, has a connection, a, a good partner, a good proposal for ecosystem, and we will try them. Um, so, you know, some of the biggest things here, I, I think I've already mentioned uh, from a business perspective what the value is. And like I said, uh, I'm searching for a way to get scale, get scale quickly, because to me, it just doesn't make any sense why these things take so long. And a lot of it is just internal uh, and to some degree external um, sort of um, training uh, that uh, our mindset that, um, you know, low cost, high volume is just not in our DNA. And that's what this is about. It's, it's all about, you know, sort of high, high cost and, high, and low volume. That, that's the way in which you operate in, in, in perspective. However, this whole process uh, is, is very good for the company. I mean, it inspires employees. You can't imagine the amount of uh, creative thought that, 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 that this has unleashed. And, uh, you know, we've really enjoyed kind of doing this. So, uh, you know, with that, I'll stop. I hope I've given you a flavor, a, a broad perspective of healthcare, uh, some of the unique problems in India. Um, at, at a macro level, which are which which need solutions, and if you're interested, I can delve more into that. Uh, but certainly, I thought that the bottom of the pyramid example would be one of interest, because th that's one that has many paradoxes around it, and one that we can all work together to solve. Uh, that, that that was great. Um, I'm just trying to say, should we? Uh, can you just comment on the last bullet, which is the, the so in this in this. Um, uh, in this example, well understood example of problems with the ears, mm -hmm. nothing complicated scientifically mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. Has this sort of experience uh, uh, been, you say it inspires creative thinking, can mm -hmm. you be a bit more concrete? Has this affected product development in Medtronic per se, or is it too small and too, no, it, it's it, too tiny? Well, it hasn't inspired product, well, it has to a degree. It has in the sense that people are thinking about about diagnostic tools, about, about things. See, we're now thinking, uh, th this gives us an opportunity to look at the entire care pathway. Mm -hmm. And so we're looking at new areas. Um, the, you know, and, and also what it has done is it's, um, it's, it's forced us to think along the disease pathway, uh, we, which we're applying to higher cost settings as well. But, but it forces you to think of relevant innovation whether it's in the thing that you're next, because just taking what you have and lowering its cost, I think I've shown is not enough. Mm. I could make that one thing that we make for 300 surgeries and give it for free and we won't go anywhere. Right. Because you only affect a few people and you won't even find them. Yeah. So it's much more effective for us to spend our time figuring out, well, how do I do the screening? Can I, make, can I do innovation around that? Can I do innovation around, uh, around different levels of treatment? And then finally, I'm, I'm gonna get my 300, mm. but that's not where the cost problem is. So I think you have to look, that's what it's taught us, that you have to look at the entire ecosystem. And you've got to look at the entire disease burden mm -hmm. and see how you move the needle and not get hung up of taking your own piece and thing just by lowering its cost is enough. Uh, it's the same, ex the broader example in India where everyone thinks that you lower the cost of product and you show up and everything will be okay. Well, it won't. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I can give these for free and it won't work. Right. And so, so, you know, you've got to think of a system. And, and, and what this is beginning to do is unleash some creative thinking around the system as to where you point your efforts at. So, uh, Connor, do you want to sure. come in now and then we yeah. can open it up? Otherwise, yeah. uh, it'll be difficult to go back and forth. So, sure. so just bear with me. I have a couple of hands and we'll just let Connor do his, uh, offer his comments on this and share his perspective and then we can open it up. Yeah.
Thank you. Thanks, Omar. Yeah. So I think what I was going to talk to, I'm a mechanical engineer. I'm not the CEO of a big medical device <laughs> corporation. So I'm going to give a slightly different perspective. But what I, I thought I'd talk about is a little bit, you know, it fits in line with the kind of creativity and part of the story that we were just hearing about and how, you know, that's an important aspect in coming up with new ways for medical technology innovation and speak a little bit to some of the work that we're doing in my lab and, you know, in general and at Harvard, more from an educational perspective. So I have a research group where we're developing, you know, a bunch of different medical technologies in a bunch of different areas. And, you know, I'm interested in how we can eventually translate a lot of them from the lab out into the real world. And another part of my job here as an academic is thinking about how do we train students at Harvard to understand what is needed in order to innovate in the area of medical technology. So I have a lab, Harvard Biodesign Lab, and really what we try and do is connect engineers with clinicians, and that's really what the lab focuses on, and then enable students to have the opportunity to work on real world um, ideas while they're here in an academic kind of low risk setting. So. You know, this is just kind of an overview of the course. I'm not going to go into detail in terms of what's on the slide, but we teach a medical device design course where we bring doctors in from local Boston hospitals. They come in and present their problems to students in the classroom, and then we basically have students work on you know, a, a project over the course of a semester to develop new innovative medical devices. And we basically start off, so the first part of it, you know, and this is kind of like, we've heard about this a little bit already, we spend a lot of time trying to understand, you know, what is the procedure, and um, where is the environment in terms of where these tools are getting used. We have students go over to the hospitals and spend time in the operating room and basically trying to understand if we were to innovate in this area, how do we make sure that it fits in with what are the needs of um, the current medical procedures that are there. And then we take students through a process that's pretty well defined, similar to what's done at Stanford, University of Minnesota, Johns Hopkins and other places, where we essentially kind of get them to brainstorm, come up with creative ideas, and then help them pick you know, the best of those ideas and eventually kind of prototype them and build proof of concept working devices. So you know, this is a great kind of experience for students. We have final presentations where we bring in a lot of people from industry. We've got um, you know, a lot of the big medical device companies. We haven't had anyone from Medtronic come yet to the final presentations, but mm. happy to have you back here. And, but we try and really make it the chance for students to showcase kind of what work they've been doing in the area of medical device innovation. And, you know, students do really work closely with physicians, and I guess, it, you know, I, I agree completely that understanding the market, understanding the stakeholders, that's basically like a critical part in the medical innovation process. And so in collaboration with the South Asia in Institute, I guess about three years ago, we started a program where we wanted to extend this beyond Boston and actually start to give students at Harvard the opportunity to be able to explore the same type of thing, but in India or in South Asia. So we got a small grant from the South Asia Institute that supported some students to go there. The first year we had an engineering student, a student from the business school, an MD student at the Kennedy School, and a student from the college. And they basically formed a team where they went and you know, spent a bunch of time at the hospitals. And they were at the Naranya Hospital in Bangalore. In the first year, that's where they were based. They were observing procedures, talking to surgeons on their lunch break and really trying to get an idea about what were some unmet needs that were there that they felt they would be able to kind of like address. And obviously this isn't addressing the full spectrum of distribution and everything else. It's very focused more on the kind of um, device technology point of view. But I think, you know, Tarun was obviously doing some other work and more on the process side at the hospital. What we were focused on this summer was the device side. And then since then, the last two summers, this is in the summer 2013 and we did it last summer as well, we partnered with the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore, where we had Harvard students basically be based with some of their Masters of Engineering students and working together and had a really great relationship with them and they facilitated um, the students visiting a bunch of different hospitals, from the big kind of hospitals um, to more of the government-run hospitals and they even went out into the kind of community, kind of local kind of hospitals as well. So that's really all I wanted to say in terms of giving a perspective on kind of what we've been doing here at Harvard. But then very interested and excited to kind of have a discussion and around these topics. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so let's let's open. Thank you, thank you, Connor, and thanks, Omar. Um, sorry, yeah. Can you just say introduce yourself in one sure. sentence? So uh, I'm Jagannath Kumar. I am here at Harvard uh, under a fellowship uh, uh, under Advanced Leadership Initiative uh, for a year. Otherwise, uh, I've been CEO for Reliance Foundation in India. 
uh, running a few healthcare initiatives, uh, including one in Mumbai with uh, 400,000 people being part of our program, urban poor basically. Uh, ideal target for your bottom of the pyramid kind of uh, market that you're talking about. We work in a bunch of other areas also in the country. Now, questions I have are one, uh, how do you select the population that you screen? Is it uh, you go to a specific area and then screen everybody or uh, you have a target population for screening? Second is, uh, what's the cost, just picking up the uh, ear infection example, what's the cost of screening per patient? Third is, uh, who pays for the uh, screening? And fourth is, uh, do you have a partnership model uh, to work with uh, different types of uh, organizations uh, uh, in India. And the last is, uh, <laughs> sorry for uh, posing too many questions, but uh, just wanted to complete that. You're on a roll, so why don't you finish? Yeah, yeah uh, because this is of interest to me, so I just wanted sure. to. Uh, so that's about uh, what's the uh, value proposition for Medtronic in the whole uh, process, other than, of course, uh, uh, helping out the uh, bottom of the pyramid uh, uh, market in terms of uh, getting this uh, uh, service. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, um, uh, let, me, let me take the bottom one first, the value proposition from Medtronic. At the crudest level, uh, look, we're, uh, this is a viable business. You know, you, you can, it's taking longer than in one, but you're creating $250 million business at, at margins that we have everywhere else. So. Okay, so it's a business opportunity. So there's, there's clear motivation there, and you're affecting people. And if you can scale uh, such ideas across, uh, this is a very limited condition, you know, ear infection. We, we work in a lot more areas. I mean, this, uh, in the scope of our therapies, this is like, you know, 1%. And so all kinds of other things that we do, if you can understand this model and can, can apply this kind of model to other disease states, you can imagine you can build a substantial business in India Look, our business in India today is $150 million. Everything, okay, everything combined, uh, including heart failure, you know, pacemakers, stents, the whole lot, $150 million. And here, okay, this is seven, eight years ago, away, but still, you're talking about $250 million from a, a, a business today that contributes nothing. And, and it's still addressing, you know, 200 million people. So, you know, the motivation, I hope you understand, is quite clear, both from a learning perspective, a business model perspective, and how we can apply. If you can apply this to other areas, this is a far more productive model uh, than all the other, st than certainly what we're doing today, where we're caught up in, uh, you know, in all kinds of regulation and, uh, you know, a system that, uh, depending on a system that's non-existent. Um, the, how much of all those questions, this whole thing is self-paid. But remember, we've only done uh, one screening camp so far uh, to scale uh, in a slum in Delhi, where I forget the exact amount that an individual pays, but it's easily affordable for them. I, mean, I don't know, 50 rupees or 100, you know, something like that. It's, it's completely affordable uh, for, for, um, uh, for individuals, uh, all the way up to the final treatment, which is done by very few people. We're willing to give like microfinance loans at the end, and we found that only in the final treatment is where they'll need that. Everywhere else is basically self-paid. Um, and, and we're working the business arrangements with the community health workers, but they essentially, uh, you know, the, the, they keep the money. They charge, they keep the money, we regulate how much they get. We're working with a local partner to, to kind of deploy this. We train the community workers in, in how they do this and have certain constraints around what they can or cannot do from a financial perspective. Um, I think, uh, did I answer all your questions? What else do I have in there? Did I miss? How do you select? Well, in this case, it's quite simple because, uh, you know, ear infections, you put a camp up there and anyone who has a ear problem shows up. So we, we don't, we, a camp means a, a sign saying, hey, you've got a ear problem, show up. And, and we put in, huh? Sorry? Well, we do it with the, with, with, the, with the ENT center. You know, our partner there. I mean, it's not that difficult. We, we do camps in other areas too, in other, so we've got some experience of doing that, of uh, how you create these screening camps, and we've done it in, in heart failure and cardiac diseases and so on. So that's fairly straightforward, uh, but essentially it's pretty, pretty crude. You know, you put signs up, you do normal kind of, you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah there, there's nothing too fancy about it. People show up, and it doesn't take long to screen. 
uh, and uh, you get the result. I mean, the, the, the key about these camps is that you should have a quick turn method of doing the screening because you'll get a lot of people and like you say, there'll be a lot of negatives and so <coughs> on, but you're gonna be able to put up with that. But equally importantly, you've gotta have a systematic, systematic way through which you do the referral. Other, otherwise, you're wasting your time. You've got a systematic way through which you do the referral. You've got to make it affordable at all stages and understand the entire chain. And I think if you can do that, you can start to move the needle. Mm -hmm. uh, sir, you had your hand in the back. Yeah, um, yeah. So you were talking about, you, you gave us a very, very innovative and simple example with the otitis. Yeah. But um, what your second last slide also had something as complex as AV block. Mm -hmm. So can you just like extrapolate on how you would go from a simple model which fixes one problem, which is more relevant, I would, I agree, than AV block. But how mm -hmm. do you, how do you, deal with a more complex issue? Well, you know, they're, they're only complex because it needs more, um, uh, perhaps a little more technology to do the diagnosis, a little more training. But in all of these conditions. These are all uh, disease states where the uh, standards of care have been established for decades. So we're not putting in here anything that is, uh, that's got any science associated with figuring out whether, how to diagnose something uh, and then how to do the treatment. So in AV block and uh, bradycardia, I mean, these are established, uh, they're using a pacemaker basically to, to, to solve these problems. The diagnostic condition is very well understood through an ECG test. You know, there's a way in which you can read it and you can interpret fairly definitively, you know, what's going on. Or at least, you know, a subset where you can uh, diagnose fairly definitively. So in each of these cases, you know, one of the screens to be on this map is that you need a condition which is, which is established, which is complete standard of care, which is, whose diagnostic and treatment is non-controversial. And it doesn't require, you need some judgment, obviously, but it doesn't require too much sort of judgment. Uh, based on that, we can start to automate tools of diagnost diagnostics. Because once you understand that, you know, this is the, the way ECG looks, you can do kind of, uh, if you have to, you can do automatic uh, alerts, you can, you, can, you can automatically screen through uh, reading these things um, uh, through algorithms. And that, that's the approach that we would take. Uh, uh, can I ask one question? Yeah. So why, why hasn't that happened already, say, in the US? Like, why do you need to develop these new tools focused on each of these specific diseases when it seems to be well understood? You know, people have been innovating for a while. So why hasn't it happened already? That's you mean the screening tools? Yeah. Well, partly because the system here exists where the doctor's training is such that they just know how to do it. And so giving them another tool to know something that I've been taught in medical school and it's like uh, second nature. I mean, there are tools available actually, uh, but it's geared to a certain level of understanding. They're not community health workers. And so these are doctors. And so they've had a certain level of training. And so the tools that they require are different from the tools a community health worker will require. And you don't have enough doctors in these countries to be able to do all of this. So you cannot replicate a Western, that I've explained, the high end of the pyramid will do that. But to take that and you drive it all the way down to billions of people is gonna take like 50 years. So that's why we're trying to approach the bottom of the pyramid in a different way, where you assume you don't have availability of doctors and you only have community health workers and, and you select conditions, again, that are well understood. And I, can I automate it enough and simplify it enough that, an, that a community health worker can act on it? So you're essentially, you're almost packaging the expertise as well as the yeah. everything else. Exactly, yeah. yeah, you have to, you have to. Uh, but, uh, I mean, even in the condition that I just said, I mean, technology has enabled it today because the community health worker can today look at this thing, take a picture, mm -hmm. and send it to somebody else. Uh, here, they don't need to do that. They just look at it. They don't need to take any pictures because the guy who looks at it knows. Mm -hmm. And so you need that extra step here. And in, in this example, that was a step. In some other example, it, maybe you send it, maybe you automatically says it. I'm sure we'll come to the point where in the uh, hearing thing, it'll probably, picture will, you'll have some kind of algorithm who reads the picture and sort of screens what you send as well. So we'll eventually get to that as well. But I, I think it's really interesting because it's, it's almost analogous to like how some emerging countries have, you know, went straight to a wireless cell phone network yeah. rather than a wire. Yeah. Right? It's basically, yeah. you know, when technology and these diagnostic tests were developed in the US, everything was based in clinic, tools yeah. were bigger, yeah. that was fine. And you've got a system that supports that. Yeah. But in these countries, you don't have a system. Yeah. So you're gonna approach it differently. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and, and simplifying um, and standardizing um, um, you know, methods 
is actually an innovation uh, opportunity, a big innovation opportunity actually. Uh, much more than, again, the traditional thinking is just lower the cost of your stuff and everything will be okay. Well, that, that, that won't do it. Uh, it. Really, the innovation has to be focused in a different way. I'm curious how, how you think about this problem when some of the obstacles are things that aren't easily controlled. And the specific example I have are coronary stents. Mm -hmm. now, India, the last I've heard, leads the world in heart attack deaths. Yep. Yep. Many of those could be saved by angioplasty within an hour. Medtronic produces yes. a lot of these stents. Yes. But when you talk to people in South Asia about, you know, why isn't this happening, they'll say you need an ambulance network. You, you can't get patients yeah. from the yeah. house to a hospital yeah. in under an hour. Yeah. And so that's the obstacle to... That's one, yeah. And so how, what, what's your approach to problems like that? Yeah, well, that's a STEMI program, which, uh, you know, is on the list, but we're, we're working that where, um, you know, there are a number of methods. Uh, first, um, I mean, we, we aren't going to build ambulances, but certainly, uh, uh, you know, creating some kind of screening methods that sit within an ambulance uh, and easy treatment uh, methodologies within the ambulance or in little community centers where the ambulances go to. I think you'll relate to the fact that one of the main problems in most of these countries, especially in urban areas, is, you know, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, you know, getting from A to B is, uh, is just not possible. So you've got to localize, the, you've got to localize the, the, the treatment as much as you can. So we're trying to, in the STEMI program that you're talking about, we're working with some, um, some other partners to develop um, uh, tools through which you can do diagnosis uh, in, in the ambulance itself and some very simple treatment in the ambulance and then create enough local centers where the ambulances can get to quickly where you can, uh, you, you can do stabilizing treatment. Because you know, in that example you can do like stabilizing treatment and then decide whether you put a stent on or not a little later when the, that, that patient can move to a place with a car. So, uh, but we're still working on that, uh, on that system. Uh, I think the problem uh, with stents, however, uh, is even, um, uh, I mean, there's even more opportunity than the, than the ambulance-based referral system because that's in emergency conditions. Uh, you've got, you know, stents that you can diagnose, you can find people through these screening camps and people eventually need stents. Uh, and even that pathway is, um, it needs some work in developing. And, and there we're working with providers, bigger providers, uh, and working their catchment, putting screening camps in those catchment, uh, training people uh, how to uh, do the referrals, when to observe the right conditions, and then um, you know finding ways of making those tents available. At, at, uh, and we're trying to work the distribution chain so that we can lower the cost to the patient as much as possible. Uh, you know, one of our goals is, uh, you know, I'm I'm willing to live with the prices that we have today in India if we can reach the patients, because I know if we reach the patients, we'll get volume. And if you get the volume, we're fine. So uh, I don't need to increase prices or do anything. I'm fine with what we have. Uh, if we can get the volume, and if we can cut out all the hands in between who kind of take a cut for doing nothing, and, and so instead just go straight to the doctor and set up units, create a catchment around it, and make it affordable for the patients. What's the price difference between the US and India? India would have the price of China. What's the US price difference? China price is higher than the US. So about 10, 15 percent higher than the U.S. China prices. So you know, that, it, it, it's still a small fraction of China with that price. So no. Bigger fraction than India. No, no, India <laughs> yeah, but still for the small fraction of the overall population. Absolutely, compared to the U.S., small, small fraction. Yeah, uh, China is a little more organized. I mean, it's got its own problems, much, much but organized. but it's more organized. <laughs> you know? And they have, they have their own problems. <coughs> Yeah. yeah, so my, my name is Shweta Sharma. I'm an yeah. ex Medtronic employee mm. and uh, very, very inspired to hear you speak and share some of your thoughts today. Yeah. My main concern with one of uh, the ear infection example, for yeah. instance, yeah. Um, specifically when you're targeting the underserved, yeah. I feel that the main bottleneck in this would be the cost of the implant or the surgery to someone who cannot afford it. And yeah. you mentioned there's the microfinance, yeah. Yeah. but uh, as it gets more complicated where you need an EP's time or a cardiologist's time or the stent itself, I mean, how, for example, in that 300 surgeries that were performed, was a majority of that group requiring 
uh, a financial... No, in this situation, they paid for it. But you know, the, the, our approach to this is the following. Uh, y you know, if you really develop the system, the volume that you... A number of things. First of all, I understand the 300 people, but through this process, you're still treating, you know, tens of thousands of people who otherwise would not get treated, who don't need our stuff, but they get treated. And I think that's a, that, that's a good thing. And if, even if you build a, a business model that just pays for itself and nothing more, that's good enough. Uh, so along the way, along the way of getting the 300, you've already helped like tens of, you know, 10 times that number of people. So that, that's an, or more, you know, uh, that, that's an important point. Now, those 300, uh, you know, if you can really execute, you know, with 70,000 patients, you get 300. With 200 million, you know, you, you're going to get a lot more. Than, you'll, you'll get like thousands and tens of thousands of patients. And at that point, the volume leverage that we'll get will lower the cost. Will but, easily lower the cost. But it wouldn't be a different implant designed for that market. I don't even. know. If we needed to, we'd do that. Because for this pur purpose, very, we can make this thing in India if we want to. I mean, there's nothing. I mean, this is stamping out of things. We, we could make this thing even cheaper. But right now, that's not the bottleneck. You know, we could make it cheaper and y y no one's been turned away yet. Uh, I mean, it's easier right now to just give it for free and solve those other people than, than worry about making it cheaper at this stage. And, and we think that if you can drive the volume up, which you can through an effective uh, overall system, the cost will, 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 I really don't think the cost is an issue here. Volume will fix the cost problem. Thank you. Uh, almost across the board. Yeah. Okay, sure. uh, I think on that point, from an innovation perspective if, uh, of the implant itself, the simplicity of delivery and the simplicity of diagnostics and the simplicity of aftercare is a bigger factor, I think, than cost. Because volume takes care of cost. Those other things, you will not get volume unless we address the other things. Okay. Hi, I'm Bigyan Bista. I'm a cancer biologist at uh -huh. MIT. Uh, my Quick question is, do you have any immediate plans to go beyond India? On this um, program? Yeah, or, or I mean, because, yeah, I mean, South Asia definitely yeah. has other countries besides yeah. India, yeah, yeah, so. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. do well, you, have any well uh, you know, first you can see from this map that we're working all over, uh, all, all kinds of different places. Mm -hmm. So we're working around the world in all kinds of underserved communities. Uh, our criteria is where do we find a partner? Okay. Uh, finding an effective partner who's willing to work with us is more important than doing a study of the population because you can virtually go anywhere sure. and you'll find enough people uh, who need any one of these problems. So, so that's more about like established hospital systems? Oh or no, who's willing to think like us okay. and who's yeah. willing to work with us and who gets excited about this mm -hmm. and devote their time and energy to this is more important than anything else. Sure. So in this one, you know, in, in Bangladesh, we've, uh, we've uh, begun to work with Grameen. Uh, on the same kind of system, uh, and then the, this is in Delhi. We've, we've also with uh, I think it's called HMRI in Hyderabad. We're working with them, so we're beginning to scale. I mean, the, the outfit that we're working with only covered Delhi, okay. so we, we need more partners around India and mm -hmm. and, and uh, around. And we're also looking at partners actually in Southeast Asia. Okay, I mean, I'm from Nepal, so that's okay. why I was yeah, yeah. just but interested. You know, again, yeah. if there's a good partner, uh, we're we're willing to. Well, what we need from the partner is. Um, uh, an ENT type center where they can do the uh, surgery and then access to patients. Sure. Like this particular clinic was close to the slum. So they were familiar with the slum. They could, they could help us recruit the right workers. So they're, they're our local partner who helps us deliver this ecosystem. Okay, thank you, thanks. So hi, I'm Urvi. I am an innovation uh, healthcare fellow at Harvard, mm -hmm. um, previously Stanford Biodesign, so yay. Um, I have a co couple of questions, and um, it's about, have you faced a trust barrier as you're scaling? And so it seems to me that you're providing services that in India, I mean, you know, g the government should have provided, and you've had to rebuild mm -hmm. all of that. Mm -hmm. And so is that sort of a problem that you faced? It's is, a big problem. Um, and then sort of, is talk to what are the scalability issues you're seeing? Is it partners? Is it getting patients? Is it sort of the already the, so in, the, the way I understand it, people have a separate network of trust based medicine going on in India. And then sometimes that's hard to face. And it's a, mm. so are you finding those problems? Is, mm. is 
Well, uh, let me take those one at a time, you know. Um, and I'll take the trust on uh, at the end because that's a very important uh, point you're raising. Um, I, I think, um, you know, from a, um, fr from a basic partner perspective, uh, th there are plenty around. You just got to select, um, se select the right ones. Um, I think where we run into a problem with the government is that the government just doesn't want to trust uh, any commercial organization, especially if it's foreign. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a problem. And we're, we're trying to find ways of breaking that barrier down by working with others. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the government, uh, not only in this area, but in all kinds of other areas, uh, are, not, uh, are not trusting. And, and frankly, um, I'm not sure they the, the, the really understand how to move the needle in healthcare. I think it's a very kind of superficial look. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I think it requires, um, it really requires a lot closer dialogue with them. Um, and, and I think it's our job to convince them that in India, as well as in other countries, uh, by intelligent uh, investing in healthcare, which we can work with them on, on a disease-focused basis, um, that we can, in fact, free up money, that they can then reinvest in, in, in broader healthcare measures. Um, we would like to, um, like, uh, you know, we can work with them on things like coronary stents. Uh, the, the point is that uh, I don't think in most emerging countries, governments view advanced disease as a problem. They view prevention as a problem. And I think that's a flaw in thinking because uh, unfortunately most of the population, whether they know it or not, has got advanced disease. And if you can, if you can actually address that, you will free up, uh, you will extend lives, working lives of, uh, of educated people who are in short supply. You will lower the cost of care, although they're the cost of care because they're not cared for. Uh, I, I don't know, is that high, but you'll certainly create an economic drive amongst people who are in their mo most productive years just give up. You know, if you talk about uh, pacemakers, a 60-year-old uh, or a 50-year-old even, Indian, with bradycardia or with some kind of a cardiac condition, will, uh, whose symptoms are that they get tired. I think you'll all relate to the fact that their family will assume that, you know, well, you know, he's had a good life and, you know, let's surround him with love and care and family and we'll string him along. And he didn't need to work. We'll cover for him. And, and that's the way it works. And, and they don't know and they don't take advantage of the fact that that one individual, through one fairly simple procedure, could live another 20 years of, of productive life. And I think that, 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 that scale across a population can have an enormous impact, which I think governments are not really uh, understanding or relating to. And that's one of our tasks to kind of explain it to them. And if you do that, that will release, release incremental funds which can then be applied to your prevention methods and all of that. But apply, uh, you know, working on prevention right now, I mean, I don't want to detract from it because it's generally good. But to think that that's going to have an impact in overall health care is not. Yeah, so in the short term, what, yeah. what are you doing in any of these developing countries to, or particularly, I guess, India or South Asia to... Uh, Work with the government? Or yeah, do you have any bright ideas or is it an impasse really, honestly? Well, uh, you know, look, uh, I have to say that right now it's more of an impasse, but, but, but we're not giving up on that. We're trying to approach the government with these. I mean, uh, look, uh, we firmly believe that there's an opportunity and there's a need and, and it can be solved. And logical, uh, reasonable people will understand it. And, and we're trying to go there in every, through every, uh, um, you know, sort of angle we can and try to present a logical case. And we're trying to build partnerships with people that the government is more willing to trust. But, but the trust uh, deficit with, uh, with industry, I think, is a big problem, which I don't know how it got created, but uh, it, it really is something that we have to collectively address. Well, and that, that's not just limited to healthcare. That's no. true in yeah. certainly in education. Yeah. 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 Um, we have this oscillating mechanism. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my, my name is Bijay Achari. I'm from Nepal, too. I'm a physician at Mass General. And my question to you is, uh, as I see this map, I see um, most of the developing world where regulations are not that strict, especially working with industry. Mm -hmm. And I can 
think of a situation where if Medtronic tries to do a screening camp in, say, uh, a native reservation here, where health outcomes and healthcare, you know, sense of data is also the similar to developing world, you'd not be allowed to do that, I presume, because of the regulations. So how do you address that when you're working with, uh, say, private hospitals in India where, you know, there's like allegations of uh, industry relationships as well as inappropriate treatment because that's a, you know, we've seen that again and again, especially with like stents, mm -hmm. uh, where, you know, you might not need a stent, mm -hmm. but that's a business model for their private hospitals so they might put a stent in. Mm -hmm. Well, a number of things. You know, first of all, um, the, the proposed, first you can't walk away from it. No one can walk away from it, including the government. And so just walking away and bracketing people in, in, according to some kind of generic, uh, you know, anecdotal experience that someone may or may not have is not the way to kind of work. And I think everyone should recognize that. And that, uh, and that to appro approach this problem the way I'm proposing it, people's business model has to change. But if our business model changes, by definition, somebody else's business model also has to change because we're not creating a business model by ourselves. It has to be someone else who's a recipient of that business model and their model, by definition, has to change. So there has to be this collaborative effort. And uh, we've got to find a way to uh, both uh, put our um, money on the line um, as well as, um, uh, as well as kind of be as transparent and as um, as reasonable and reasonably as logical as possible, uh, we're willing to uh, develop systems which are outcomes based, where where we get paid only when a patient gets better, uh, and we take the cost of uh, of the care of that patient. That that'll provide us with an incentive, not to incur cost if the patient needs it. Uh, so there are different methods of solving that problem. The the, the one that you raise. Um, is a, is, a, is a problem that every stakeholder uh, kind of can be accused of in a, in a, in a world where, where you get fragmented care models, where you get, you get paid for something that has got partial, uh, only, only part of the way to closure. You know, in the U.S., we have a, you know, the same problem manifests itself through an inflative cost of care overall. Everyone thinks it's okay because it's all legal and you've got regulation, but the cost of care is too high because all of this stuff is going on in a, in a completely legal and regulated environment. Uh, and so I think the core of the problem is fragmented care. And, and you've, got, you've got to have an outcome that everyone can relate to and people get paid when that outcome improves and not when your piece is done. And I think that model essentially has to be translated into other other areas so like screening camps example that you gave you know we are allowed to do it here too we have to do it in, in association with, uh, with, with 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 the provider network um, and we do the same thing in in the we don't do it by ourselves we do it together with our partner so we we just provide the uh, some of the uh, manpower that does it but uh, you know we never are in the position we it's, it's completely outside our policy and we would never do it where we make the clinical decisions ourselves okay so we, we expect that's why we need a partner who makes the clinical decisions we facilitate uh, you know decision support so that that clinical clinical decision making can be made objectively and correctly okay I think it's yeah. interesting I think are you not focusing on the disease I'm yeah working on no. I have one on here. Yeah, he's. And yeah. is this not working? No. Oh, it's working. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sure. Okay. So, if you're focused on across the, the a disease and working on the you know diagnosis, prevention, and yes, follow, yes, then you control that. Yes. Right. So yes. That's an advantage. Uh, more than control, you're you're accountable for it. Yeah. And you'll do make the right decisions. Yeah. And, and that's why and and that's why the value of the healthcare system is at the end of it. Any l one piece of that does not carry the value. Uh, you know, I, I'll give this example in the, in the US or in developed markets, but it, it's true everywhere. Um, today, we sell devices, okay? We get paid when the device gets put in. The hospital gets paid when the device gets put in because the reimbursement agency <coughs> gives them money. Uh, yet, the value of the device is realized once the patient leaves the hospital. So when you put a stent in, 
you know, other than incurring cost, you've done nothing else. Okay, the, the, the value of that stent occurs when the patient goes home and feels better and is more productive and doesn't have to come back to hospital. Yet, if when the patient goes home and they don't take uh, medication, that they also need a lot with the stent, and is to keep coming back to the hospital or worse still their condition worsens, the system will simply pay for that cost again. And yet in the original payment, what was built in was not, not simply the manual cost of doing the work and the manual cost of the device, but what was implicit in that is that you get a cured patient. And yet the system doesn't pay or hold anyone accountable to make sure that the value of what you just put in is actually realized. And I think we've got to change that. Yeah, I think another example is, say, in orthopedics. Like, if you have the best orthopedic surgeon putting the best hip implant, if you don't do your rehabilitation properly, yeah. you won't get good outcomes. Yeah, and this guy's got paid for it once he puts it in. Yeah. And so, so I think you've got to change this to a model where once the patient gets better is what you've originally paid for, and maybe you pay a little more or whatever, but, but, but I think there's a lot of uh, way, it's very important for us to start thinking about it that way. And, and I think that concept has to be central to your example, the cell phone example, has to be central to any new model that we create where no model exists today. To create a model which is fragmented in, 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 in the, amongst the bottom of the pyramid, I think is going to be, first, I don't think it's possible, second, it'll make a huge mistake. So yeah. Just, just yeah. on, that, on yeah. that issue, um, you know, sometimes we have people, uh, particularly at the business school, right, uh, there's part of the time, uh, we have people coming and saying that uh, it might be easier to experiment your way to that sort of model in a relatively uh, virgin territory where there is no system uh, from mm. developing countries. Mm -hmm. But when you listen to what these developing countries are like, mm -hmm. can do, mm -hmm. it's hard to see that happening. Well, unless you do things like what I've just said, simple things, and you can build yeah. an ecosystem yeah. where it's self-paid for, you know, yeah. I, I think yeah. that that's really the only way to do it. Yeah. yeah, you can't do that for transcatheter valves or you know some fancy stuff like that. You'll never do it. Oh, I mean, you could. So there's a potential experimentation. Yeah, but, uh, but you can't yeah. do it for everything. Yeah. Again. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but but you you I th I think for uh, for standardized uh, conditions you could probably try some of it. You could probably try some of it, but uh, but I I think. Um, in the U.S., for example, and in the West in general, the cost of care is escalating to a level that you have to do something like this anyway. And here yeah. it's such a political economy problem. Yeah, really, just yeah. Just reallocating it for that. Yeah. yeah. So if I could, I, I wanted to rephrase my first question. Sure. Uh, so that perhaps I didn't convey it correctly. So yeah. uh, the example you, so I'm, so for, my name is Saad Mehmood. I'm a physician here at Mass yeah. General. Yeah. Um, so the, the example you gave of, you know, otitis externa yeah. is yeah. one where the diagnos diagnosis has very low upfront costs, yeah. okay? But in a country in South Asia, diabetes, uh, coronary artery disease are the largest burden globally. Yeah. And the diagnostic workup for both of these requires an upfront cost. Yeah. So I see diabetes over there from Mexico. Yeah. I, can you, I just, we just, I just was interested in learning. Yeah, How sure. would you increase the catchment area? Yeah. Given that in order to diagnose diabetes, you have, yeah. there's a huge upfront cost because one, you have to draw blood, then you have to send the lab, then somebody has to, uh, you know, uh, look at the result and assess whether or not the patient has diabetes. Then a phone call has to be made. So can you give me an example? I, I guess what I'm asking for is uh, can, if there is an example of what Medtronic has done at a slightly more complex level. Um, yeah. at uh, chronic issues. If there's one, if you could just tell us how you've done that. I'd yeah, I, I mean, look, all, all these other examples are formative. N none of these have gotten to the state of the one that I gave you. So, so, we, we, so I'll put that first thing in context. But, but I will give you examples where things like that can be done. Um, you know, the diabetes one, in the scheme of things, uh, actually in many ways is easier than some of the other conditions which, which, which are even, you know, you need a scan or something to diagnose. Um, here, you know, drawing blood and testing, you, you can create an ecosystem which is fairly cheap, actually, to do that. Because to do the actual test can be done on a roadside. I mean, this is not expensive. To do a strip test of diabetes, a one-point test is, 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 not that, is not that complex. And I think as you go up the chain, it does get more difficult, especially if you've got a titrate medication and all of that. So I, I think there's a lot of things that, can you, that you can do just by, just by a little organizing uh, along what 
was just simply possible. That, that's the first step. Now, beyond that, though, in the diabetes example, the one that, that I would go to is that, uh, you know, we, we can, we can uh, the volume plays such a big role in this, that if we can find a way of, of reaching, reaching scale, we can come up with innovation that, that uh, we have available that with scale will get cheaper. You know, things like continuous glucose monitoring that can be put in once uh, at, at a very low cost setting. Uh, once you uh, actually diagnose that a person needs something like this, and then you need, you could have automated tools through which the uh, patients can do self-management through mobile phones. You can do automated tools so that doctors can titrate medication more effectively. Uh, you, you, can, you can, once you have a, a footprint and an understanding, there are more expensive methodologies which in its core is not expensive if you get the volume, which we can systemize using uh, you know, software and, and kind of get there. That, that's the kind of thing we'll have to do, and, and that's essentially in Mexico in diabetes, that we're, that's what we're doing. We've actually found a partner who um, has the catchment set up where he's drawing patients in. He's drawing patients in, he's doing very simple tests where, where it's affordable, but it's all manual today. And, and that's an ideal setup for us, where he's got access to volume, it's manual, he's limited then to scale up because there's only so much you can do manually, but he's got access to patients. Then we can come in, do an assessment of how do you automate that. How do you automate that? Uh, because now I know that if I can automate it, I can reach 10 times as many people. Once I reach 10 times as many people, my cost goes way down. And, and then we can start to address it. So I think the volume element in this thing is so important. And, and by the way, to all of you, uh, this is as much of an internal Medtronic cultural issue as it is with uh, external. I mean, we, don't, we just traditionally don't think that way. No one thinks that way. You know, the, the number of people who really think of the bottom of the pyramid as a volume opportunity and that cost will come down because you've got volume, people can't imagine that you can get such volumes. They just don't believe it because no one's used to it. And yet it's there. And, and so, so I, I think one of the things we're trying to do here is force our teams to go in there and answer the questions you're talking about. Because I, I truly believe that thinking about this thing systemically and, 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 and capturing the volume will automatically lower the cost. And then we can work on further refinement of, uh, of cost. But, but, and, and in all of this, innovation is still required. But like I said, it's in the simplicity. It's in taking these tools that I talked about today where we expect doctors to read it which you can automate. Which the core is there, you automate, allow it to reach much more people, and the more expensive element of it, which is usually an implant of some sort, that cost, which is difficult to reduce in any other way, you reduce by volume. So th I hope, you know, I've at least tried to answer your question, but, but look, I, I just want to make it clear, all of these are very early stages, so we're learning as we go along. Okay. One other comment, it seems like yeah. my brief time in India, it seems like would it be an accurate statement to say there are more specialty centers in India than there are in the U.S.? Or was that just, you know, you know, in Bangalore where I was, but, you know, eye centers, it seems like there's... There's, there's a signboard for everything, huh? Yeah, it seems yeah. like there's, you know, as opposed to, like, hospitals, you know... <laughs> well, there are hospitals, too. You no, know, but as opposed to hospitals, you know, anything that's, like, you know, the big established hospital that does everything, it seems there are, like, these, you know, uh, either more recent or... Well, I don't know. Many others can comment on this. I, my sense is that the quality level of those is very variable. Okay. So if some guy puts a sign up doesn't mean they know what they're doing. I mean, it's just, <laughs> you know. So, so I think there are more many hospitals. Okay. I think given the population, though, you put up a sign of a hospital, you'll get a people showing up. Mm -hmm. so, so the need is so big. And if you've ever been to one of these, you know, you, you see people in corridors and lining up. And, you know, I mean, it's just people everywhere. So the, the, the number of patients and the, is so large and the need is so big that people see business opportunities and put a sign up and say, hey, I'm a doctor. And, and the regulation level of those are, is very poor. And, and so I, I'd be, I, I don't know, any, Tarun, what, what's your thought around no, that? No, I yeah. agree. I mean, you know, just related yeah. to that, this yeah. whole field of uh, one place where I see a lot of pitches to me for investment opportunities are in pharmacovigilance, which mm -hmm. is fake drugs. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, you know, just such a rampant problem. Yeah. Uh, I think there was some study that I saw from some credible outfit. Yeah. 
that said 365 percent of medication had uh, was was doctored somehow. Yeah. <laughs> doctored, no pun intended, but different. I mean, yeah. adulterated. So I think the same issue of quality is a big deal. It's a big deal yeah. in food also. It's a yeah. big deal, and not just India. I mean, all the developing countries. So getting the food supply chain and the health supply. Yeah. That, that that's why Tarun, you know, I, I think solving this at a at a comprehensive level for everything is very difficult. I, it's not something so we I can. Your do. point, I think yeah. you know, I, I, I like I like the view of things. Yeah. Start with the disease. Yeah, the that we can control, that we can manage the constraints, and just kind of do it. But the yeah. issue, the thing that you yeah. know, so I spend a lot of time doing comparative work. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. think one of the things that India, for sure, and some extent all the South Asian countries have been pathetic at, is taking a good idea and scaling it up. Yeah. I mean, we've got a, a fluorescence of good ideas in South Asia. Every corner there's some yeah. clever guy doing yeah. something clever. Yeah. But what you know, what, what China really did very well, perhaps because of its top down structure to yes. some extent, yes. is take the good ideas and forcibly scale them up. Yes. Uh, now that's a simplistic summary. No, no, but you're right. Yeah. But that idea of scale up, that mentality is not there. So we're very good at democratized yeah. Seed, seed stuff. Yeah. Very scale up. yeah. And even the uh, the more even the bigger hospital chains have trouble scaling yeah, ab yeah, above yeah, a certain yeah, level. Yeah. For, forget about your mom and pop guys. I mean, they they, they just don't know how to do it. Uh, but you're right about that. You know. And then, then yeah. you ask the, the trust question, right? I mean, so this is, in a sense, this is also the trust issue, uh, right? You don't. Why do you not scale up? You don't scale up because you don't have the credible interfaces to work with other people. You don't trust them. Mm. And so the trust issue kind of permeates society. Mm -hmm. uh, again, it's a comment about many developing countries, not just not just India. And to me, the entrepreneur's problem is that's the problem. Is you can crack the trust issue, mm -hmm. you are you know I don't know fifty percent there. And on just on that note, sure, I'll sure. just abuse my prerogative for a second. Um, some of the doctors recently told me, and we've got a team of five uh, uh, doctors and engineers working on this very interesting project, uh, realizing that there are more um, in India. We call them Ayush workers. Yeah. 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 The, yeah. The, the, yeah. The, the, the traditional medicine uh, providers. Um, there are a lot of them. Uh, there's a million of them in, in just in semi-urban India, and uh, they are minimally trained. Mm -hmm. um, probably have some good skills that are useful, mm -hmm. and some that, by s modern scientific standards, may be of dubious validity. But to me, the more interesting thing on the trust issue is that they have the trust of the community. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me to be a really you mm -hmm. know, completely wasted asset. Mm -hmm. No, but, but I, I agree. I, I agree completely. In fact, the, our approach towards community health workers is driven by exactly that. Yeah, that no, but you've got a yeah. million of these. So yeah, no, I know, but uh, you could just target them. But, but, but I think with the HMRI, actually, they have a lot of these guys. And, and so that's how we're trying to scale. That the, 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 uh, and that's our sort of uh, version of it. That that, uh, w but the but the uh, the concept that you lay out, yeah. that how if you can, them, yeah, how to leverage people like that who are g who've got the trust of the community, yeah. uh, who, and who need help, and who can make a little money out of this. Uh, I I think that's that's exactly the the, the thinking that, that we have around this. And and I, you know HMRI is the biggest partner that we've got right now. They've got some connection with the government, and we think that through them maybe we can scale this up more. They've got all kinds of other things they're doing, so we've got to see how all that goes. Yeah. So related to that point, you, you've kind of got, you know, a model, say, in the U.S. or some other established healthcare market where things are done a certain way. You're changing how things are done. How much do you have to validate that the new way of doing it works as well as those other ways, or is it just the fact that nothing else exists and this is yeah. better than that? Oh, yeah, yeah, nothing else exists. Nothing exists. Yeah, I mean, uh, nothing else is going to exist because the U.S. model, by definition, is not going to go there because you need doctors. So I anything that depends on an infrastructure like in the U.S. is just not going to work. Um, and it's more than just people, the system. System doesn't exist. And you can't recreate the system. And, and to your earlier point, it's pointless recreating a system that was built here you know, 100 years ago based on all kinds of technologies that today are, uh, have been Absolutely. circumvented. Or obviously. So, so you might as well start that from scratch because nothing else exists. So then how do you change the obsolete technologies that are in the U.S. then? <laughs> you know, so, you know, it, it, do you, but it, is that something that you guys, you know, you didn't really talk on that today, mm, but, mm. you know, the, the technologies that you're developing for mm. these new markets, do you see that then becoming yeah. standard of care? In other no, but not in the same way. Okay. Not in the same way because, because you know, um, you'll st you still need customization to this market. The concepts of using lower skilled workers uh, and proving it, may be applicable, but you don't want to 
solve a problem that isn't one. You know, li like this ear infection problem isn't one. I mean, it's fine. Everyone can afford it. It all works. You're going to save pennies by trying to, you know, train right. somebody else to do it. So you, you've, got to, you've got to apply that intelligently, the concepts intelligently to real problems. And, and then may maybe there are some. It's not an obvious translation where you just lift it from there and just park it here. You, you've got to customize the concept to the local need. Yeah. What are your thoughts about the prospects of a generic device industry? If you're successful at these ecosystem things and you create a huge demand for ear devices, let alone cardiac stents, presumably you'll see the emergence of a generic device industry just like India has seen the emergence of a generic pharmaceutical industry. Mm -hmm. And do you have plans to manage that or work with that? Well, you know, we don't, uh, the, the device industry is um, the different from the um, um, uh, pharmaceutical industry in that we're not that, um, you know, our, our um, cycle time for innovation is much shorter. Uh, the, the, the ability and the room for innovation to go around IP is much bigger. You, c you can easily change something that has the same result with a little different method. So, you know, the word generic um, in many ways, you know, doesn't really have the same connotation as with drugs. Um, whether you can um, uh, make things, um, you know, locally and all that, I think what you cannot confuse it with is making devices that are imperfect in terms of their clinical data. Uh, and, and I think you can run into that problem. Like, uh, you know, you, you can get long-term problems because they're, they're not clinically proven. So you, you've got to prove the quality of something. And as we make things cheaper, uh, you cannot compromise on the quality. So you've got to maintain the same quality. You've got to compromise uh, on other things if you have to, but better skill is still get the, the, get the, get the cost leverage be simply through volume. If you get the cost leverage simply through volume, you haven't you really compromise anything at all, and and then you can kind of move from there. Um, so I, I don't really see um, in some areas there may be some local manufacturers doing things which are which are smarter, which are which is fine, and we should be able to compete with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think in the area of surgical tools, for example, there's quite a bit of that. In in spinal implants, there's a bit of that, and you know you can call it what you want. It's, it's locally manufactured. We don't use the term generic, but it's is locally manuf manufactured, you know, knock off sometimes, and I think that's fine. Uh, you know, if they can do it, we can do it. Yeah. <laughs> so, but but the, the, the advantage in, in, in devices is that the, the innovation cycle is much shorter, much shorter, yeah. Do you have a chance? I was going to ask, do we have time for last question? Uh, sure, we can do sure. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. All right, so I was just, I was just talking about the network. So you have a network now in Delhi for doing these ear infections. Are you going to reuse it for something else? No, because this is a specialist for ENT. Now we might because for of the partner yeah the nature of the partner yeah, nature yeah, of yeah the and the nature of the part. So we got to make sure, remember the disease focus. Okay. Now if we can use the same facility for a related disease, that's fine. Okay. And then we've got to make sure that the training is adequate. And so so the the, the leveraging across for scale in my mind comes secondarily. You get the scale to the same thing over a broader population before you try scale over the same population for different things. That's more difficult to get, okay? More training and the outcomes are different and you know, the same partner won't be able to do it. So, so I think that's the way in which we look at it. Okay? Yeah? Yeah. Robert, Robert Gregucci, <clears throat> the increase in diabetes in India, is that lifestyle changes or? Uh I, I think it is, yeah. yeah. I, I think a lot has to do with lifestyle changes. Uh, uh, poor uh, diets, uh, poor, um, uh, you know, the, the movement from a, a rural society where um, people were much more active to an urban society where, um, you know, lifestyle is uh, much less active together with, uh, you know, unfortunately with increased income, poorer diets. Uh, I, I think that's got a lot to do with it. I think, uh, I do think, although we've shown diabetes in Mexico, you know, we've got a big focus in India as well to try to kind of do it. And, and it's along the lines that I mentioned earlier, 
that do we use uh, technology in some way to train people um, to influence their lifestyle and to train doctors to medicate better and, and, and figure out what technology we need to, to kind of uh, enable that. Okay. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you.